All right, good morning, everybody. Steve Coffey here. Um, doing something a little bit different this morning. We're going to be talking with Greg Jeffers, who works over with the Elf and Wildcats at MBL1, who's going to share a little bit about what he does in the coaching aspect, as well as the development manager within the club. Um, looking forward to a lot of great information coming your way. It's a little bit different than the player one, but just as important for all of you out there who are interested in this type of experience. So thanks for being here this morning, Greg. No, thanks for having me, Steve. Looking forward to it. Yes, definitely. Um, could you share a little bit about yourself, your background, um, where you're from, your coaching, if you've got any playing experience, just what you've done to get to this point? Uh, I'm a, a hack of a player and always was and, uh, <laughs> and stepped away now, but uh, always had a, a, a long passion for the game. Um, I wasn't a, wasn't a super good uh, footy player and, and mum advised me this sport would be pretty cool and I gave it a go and Actually, it was when I was growing up, lived up on the Murray River at a town called Baruga on New South Wales side. And uh, basketball up there, I remember it. We, we had outdoor courts at the school, but basketball resulted every time we made a basket, the ball came back to the middle for a, for a jump ball or a, or a centre center tip, as we called it then. If, if you can understand how that relates to AFL, um, <laughs> that, was what, that was our basketball. That was my introduction to it. So uh, it came from... Uh, a uh, way back and uh, yeah, developed along the way and always, I, I remember being at school, I didn't have, um, I, I, I hated school um, with a passion, didn't like most of my teachers and was was fairly independent at a young age because um, I, I was a swimmer as a kid, being individual sport, I was treated as an adult and just really struggled with the old school settings, it's a bit different how they operate now but certainly back then I struggled. Um, and, and so my sports coaches were my, I guess, the uh, the role models, my sports coaches, being a local domestic club, Coonung Basketball Club, when we moved to Melbourne in, in Mont Albert. Uh, my family's still involved there now, actually. But I had young coaches there, and they were 20, 21-year-old guys. And, and I had a swimming coach in, in, through our elite programs, um, Julie Dyering, who I'm still connected with now. Um, and, and I think it was their influence as to how I got into coaching. At the age of 13, one of my coaches at Kunung asked me, do you want to coach a team? And next thing you know, I'm coaching under 11 girls with one of my sisters in it. So and it all sort of just went from there. Um, uh, and to be quite honest with you, the coaching and involvement led to me getting onto committees and boards as a, as a teenager. I think I was on a committee and the committee at the Kunung Club at, at 15 and it was in debt and struggling. And I pleaded with mum to, to take on the secretary role and and uh, her and myself at 15, along with a couple of local adults, sort of turned the ship around. And those of the, in the Eastern Districts competition now will know the, the Coonan Club as being 85, 90 teams strong and, uh, wow. and a great feeder of talent. So that's, that's really my, my base. And, and, I, and to look at where I am now is many thanks and probably due to the leadership and the role models I had as, in sports coaching. Yeah, one of the things about... Um, that's awesome is, you know, they're not just on the sideline during the games. They're also role models off the court. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of athletes look up to players in the NBA and AFL or whatever as, you know, quote unquote role models, but coaches are people you have a relationship with. I know for me, personally, my high school coach was someone who was a role model. We had a lot of talks and he really helped develop me into the person I am today. So to see you take the lead from the ones who helped you at a young age and then even at a younger age, taking that on is amazing. Um, how did you relate to the kids your age who are probably out playing when you're the one who's kind of running the club to try and make things better? <laughs> really something that you hear about often is a 15 year old involved in the politics of the club. Most 15 year olds are out on the court or on the footy field. You're in the office. <laughs> uh yeah, look, a lot of people who know me now kind of would laugh. Um, but back then I was I was involved in, uh, there was a housing development that was got next door. And I remember being a 15, 16 year old getting up at public protests, or not protests, but, but public uh, group meetings regarding the development in front of Phil Good, who was the education minister in Victoria during those nineties under Jeff Kennett. And, um, and in those public forums and being quite outspoken. Um, I look back and kind of it's it's silly, but it's how, how I how I was and pretty thankful. Mum always mum and dad always pretty happy for me to be independent, encouraged me to do that. I dropped out of school at fourteen, 
Um, I did year 11 as a 14 year old, hated it, dropped out. Um, yeah, mum and dad, I think I scared them, but they trusted me and uh, went back and I finished it going via Box Hill TAFE. I, I did year 11 and 12 and a bit unorthodox in how we did it, but, uh, but it's all opportunities. And I owe so much to those opportunities I had at the Kunun Club. Uh, yeah, my mates were playing and I played, don't get me wrong, I, I played, it just wasn't, I just knew I wasn't very good. Swimming was kind of, I used to joke I could swim and probably now it's the same. I could probably swim quicker than I run. If you put me in 100 metres, I'd probably get the end the end of the pool in 100 quicker than I would run it. But um, yeah, look, the coaching was something I always enjoyed and it, it, it gave me a chance. So I enjoyed and still do educating young people and working with young people. And certainly it's it's changed as I've got older. It's changed how I'm involved and I was overly passionate and overly I was, I think, I think back, if I look back at videos of myself coaching as a 17, 19 year old, again, I was taking off leaders that I understood at the time and that was a good way to coach and it was probably the old school way. Um, you're probably a little bit disappointed looking back at some of that, but that's how, that's what we knew and it's what we did and uh, pleased to say we've, we've adjusted over that time. But again, that's, that's looking at models of behaviour and, and other coaches and other leaders and also recognizing that as I've sort of moved into the administration management, that you, you're also a role model in that role and you can't behave in that way. Um, so yeah, look, during those years, I remember I, I went across to Bulleen and got involved on their WNBL. I was, I was helping a little bit with their WNBL stuff when Bulleen had the WNBL team when I was in my late teens. Um, Cause I was coaching their junior program for representative level. Um, Ross Wignall at Basketball Victoria knocked on my door and had seen what I did at Coonung. I did a lot of um, camps for Basketball Victoria on the holidays and, and I got a job at Basketball Victoria. It was my first full-time job was in coaching and development at Basketball Vic. Uh, and I just, you know, you just look back and you go, you kind of, I got lucky. There's no two ways about it. I, I went an unorthodox route to, to do what I do, but um, I, I also did the hard work as well um, behind the scenes and, and did things that most people aren't doing to to ensure I built up my experience, I think, on the job to then be ready to move into coaching or, or management roles as I have. Yeah, I mean, that's great um, encouragement to, you know, people that there isn't one set way of doing it the same way for most players. Everybody takes a different route unless you're LeBron. Yeah. And everything's handed to you because of the ability you have. You know, dropping out of high school and doing what you did to where you are now might seem unorthodox, but it is possible. Um, as you said, hard work is yeah. um, makes anything – available and here you are years later you know at Eltham and the L1 very good club so there is no set way of doing it which is awesome um as a coach you know when you're younger who are some of the role models of coaches that you looked up to as players we have our players but there's also coaches that we all you know look up to with admiration you know Phil Jackson Brett Auerbach guys like that they're common names did you have someone that you looked up to like that look I, I again I'm probably different to be honest, I, because in the 90s, I didn't have access. We didn't watch the NBA like everyone does now. And, and nor, nor, certainly not college. Uh, and I know a lot of people my age are far more uh, across that, that era than what I probably was. But I just didn't grow up with it. I just didn't. I, I devoted so much time to doing local stuff. And, and I remember coaching four. I'd coach four Saturday junior domestic sides for years and years on end. And and look after at that stage, it was a 35, 40, 45 teams from a director of coaching type role. I just devoted so much time to the local stuff that I didn't see and didn't get as much exposure to the NBA in college as to what most people did. Didn't have that same passion as a player to understand it. Um, and, and that's probably changed over the time. But back then it was so, you know, my, my role models really were, were very much people involved in local junior and and senior stuff here in Australia. Uh, and I, I won't know, I said before, I used to be a little bit uh, crazy as a coach and passionate. And that would be, funnily enough, that used to be especially the case when it come to Eltham. I, Eltham was the opposition back then and Eltham was the big bad dogs. You, you, weren't, <laughs> you weren't supposed to like Eltham. And, and that certainly was the case when I was younger. And it was because they were a powerful club. They were, they were the biggest and uh, they were always the, 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 the toughest to play against. So you're supposed to dislike them. But, uh, you know, you look at coaches and you think that's, some real positive, as I said, Julie Diring is my swimming coach, was, was the person that I based everything that I did off. Um, she was strong. She, she gave you a whack when you deserved it, but, but was 
the supporting person, the supporting leader that you needed her to be. And, and uh, as I said, I re reconnected with her in the past 12 months, 18 months. And uh, yeah, still, still a very, very influential person on, on me as a person um, and me as a leader. Um, but in terms of, in, you know, there was Jeff McLeod at Another Warning Spectres. He gave me an opportunity to rep my first, really my first rep side. Um, Nick Linton and Scott Christensen at Bulleen uh, got me over as an 18 year old from Nutter Wadding to Bulleen to give me my first first team. I remember thinking it was the most amazing thing ever as an 18 year old and I was coaching the 12 one boys at Bulleen. You know, it's another powerful club and again, probably one of the enemies of Eltham. Um, uh, I did youth league with Sarah, Sarah McKenna and, and uh, some of the players, Lauren Pierce, who's now, um, uh, women's uh she's part of the afl for melbourne as the ruck ruck for uh, for melbourne in the footy she was a part of that as just a 15 year old but i was coaching that i would have said i was 23 23 thereabouts 24 coaching the under 23 youth league team at bulleen a team which is mostly under 20s 18 to sort of 16 to 19 20 year olds um coach the senior championship women at, at bulleen and Observed a lot of Cheryl Chambers coaching WNBL, who's now, she was Bulleen's WNBL coach at the time, now Southside Flyers WNBL coach. Observing her and her relationships with players. She's such a players coach. Um, developed such good, low budget at that team, but, but had strong relationships with players to get the best out of them. And you look some of her, some results, some of those Bulleen results in those, um, I would have said mid-2000s, mid uh, I think it was about then. There were some extraordinary results that she got out of the group that she had. Uh, and probably watching her changed my coaching a lot in terms of how I led junior teams and, and, and senior sides. So, yeah, look, I think you grab a little bit from everyone. You know, even now you watch Craig Stratford at, at Eltham. He's our 81 boys coach, currently the Vic Metro coach. You know, you watch him and that changes your style a little bit again. And, and the Grant Spencers and the work that he puts in behind the scenes as an NBL1 women's coach, um, Trevor Lee, you know, I think you grab a little bit from everyone, good bits and bad bits. And like we ask players to do, we, we give them the information and it's up to them to weed through what they, what they carry on and, and sort of what they choose not to use. Yeah, for sure. Do you have like a set style of coaching you prefer? Um, obviously there's so many different ways of playing. You can walk the ball up, use the shot clock, you can do Mike D'Antoni seven seconds or less. Um, which drives some people mad. Is there something that you <laughs> do? Obviously, I know you adapt to your team. But yeah. This is something that, as a coach, is something I like to do. Yeah, look, you're right. You, you adapt heavily. And probably not having such a, a strong playing background. And, and to be honest, it, it's, a, it's a problem. It's, it's a negative on my part is that, that I was always head coach. I never actually, to this day, I still haven't actually assisted anybody. So... I haven't sat there and actually just really learnt different, I guess, the ins and outs. And, and from that, that's a negative. But the positive to it is I am far more flexible in terms of how I operate different groups probably than most people um, and, and allowing for completely different styles. I know everyone says it. Um, I think it's pretty evident if you look back across our groups. And I was incredibly lucky at Eltham to coach the state champ women's team in 2011. And we had... Uh, to be honest with you, Steve, I, I, I best class myself as the manager of that team and not the head coach. And if I throw names at you like Holly Grimer, um, sorry, now Holly Florence, uh, Katrina Hibbert, uh, Eleanor Sharp, sorry, now Eleanor Cesare, um, Zoe Carr, like that was, that was a stacked, stacked lineup. Katrina Hibbert's a WNBA, a WNBA player. Holly was, Holly was part of the 2006 World Championship gold medal team. I, I sat there and managed that team and we we're far more... Uh, based around their talents than uh, than anything that I did, but but then you know something like our youth championship men, uh, I took over when the team was zero and eleven, and I think the percentage was at they were at uh, had a percentage of fifty eight or something like that, and it wasn't the head coach's fault. Um, he'd started afresh, and actually we had a bit of a problem with our senior man, and and Leo Malvaso took a promotion up to the senior side just to try and get. He was an incredibly good manager of people. Um, and still is. He's still with our club now and, and does a terrific job. Um, but Leo went and took our senior men and, and, and I stepped in on the youth men and we took a bit of a tact of, of rebuilding that. And it was all about culture. And it was, 
I've probably given a lot of my teams a lot of freedom, a lot of creative freedom at the offensive end. And with that one, it was very structured, very organized as we rebuilt. And, and it's, this is how we're going to operate and because we needed to change culture. And, and I'm pleased to say over that three or four year time building from within, um, well, our youth champ men now of back to back runners up in that under 23 men's comp. I think it's four out of the last five years have got themselves into the, into the final four. Um, so where that, that rebuild, that rebuild was very different. Um, but the 18s team that we had, was it the, the 90 and 98 boys born boys. So it would have been in 2015, we won the national classic, you know, they'd come up together. So many of them played together for so many years. I remember in 18s, we just gave them some basic principles and let them play. And they were such a high IQ group. Um, and they went on to win the national junior classic in, in June of 2015 and, and injuries smashed them in the back half of that season for the state title. But, you know, that group still with us today, they're, they're sort of those guys that are on that fringe of NBL one now, um, having come out of the youth championship program, but we gave them a lot of creative freedom, but the idea is always to play it fast. Um, uh, but you know, it's the under 14 girls I had last year, they were, they were built on, they built on the ability to play D uh, and we just shut teams down and we, it, it, it hurt us through most of the year, but I think certainly by the end of the year and we got ourselves into the top four, those under 14 girls, you know, they, they played tough D uh, and, and that was best defensive record in the competition uh, by the end of it, because that's, that's kind of what that group needed to achieve. They needed to be, needed to be better at, and I think we did it. So yeah, I think everyone says they're flexible, but I think the data over the years suggests that that's exactly what I've tried to be. Okay. Um, what do you think to you are the most important elements of being a coach and building a successful team? Um, you mentioned culture, which to me is probably the most important part yeah. in terms of the club, because if you don't have the culture, everything else falls apart. That's kind of like that starting block that builds everything off of. Um, anything else that you'd say, these are things that make a team successful. You know, there's film situations, there's skill development, there's some teams that practice every day because more practice makes better, they believe. But, you know, what are your okay, it's at El, I mean, for Eltham, it's, it's a bit different because it's the one club stream from bottom to top. And it's so that's uh, from our three-year-old, four-year-old kids all the way to the top. You wear the one singlet all the way through. So while, yeah, culture within a team is important. But what we've, we've really tried to do is tie the youth youth men's and women's and the NBL one men's and women's into the club as best we can, rather than it sort of being separated as has happened at most associations in the past and, and, and probably today. So it actually has to be the culture of the club that ties in then, and the team's got to represent that. So, so we operate with a no D head policy. And again, a lot of people will say it, but again, our, our coaches, especially on the men's side, as we rebuilt that from 20, from 2013. I mean, we had some brilliant men's teams in 2011 and 2012, but there, there, there were some really good players and really good people in those groups, but there were also some, some characters that, that made it the culture, not just of our senior teams, but the culture of the club uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it was very much about not where we knew the culture at the junior level was good and what we'd rebuilt within the junior program was good. And we wanted to flow that through to the seniors. And if anyone was going to come from the outside, uh, and mess with that, then it was going to be thanks, but but see you later. And we did that on numerous occasions, mid-season, you know, with senior men's or women's players. That if they were going to make the environment uncomfortable, then we're, we're not really not uncomfortable from a development point of view, but uncomfortable from a position that people don't want to be there. Then then thanks and and see you later. Um, but you've got to have leaders in your role. You've got to have coaches that are leaders. And it's not there to be best mates with mum and dad. It's not there to be, to have drinking buddies. It, it is there to be able to lead a group. And certainly social occasions between the coaches and players is, is always a positive thing, but there's, there's a limit to it. And, and our coaches need to be there as basketball leaders and be someone that uh, the players want to turn up to training and want to be giving their best to come game day. They want to be mixing with the kids. You know, I'm not sure if you've had a chance yet. 2020 obviously makes it hard, but, you know, at the back end of Big V, one of the big reasons why we wanted to move out of Big V and into NBL1 at the end of the 2018 season, we felt like we'd outgrown Big V. We, we felt like the crowds and the kids and the people that were attending, you know, we had the best. Our venue isn't the best show court by any stretch of the imagination in Big V or, or at NBL1 level. Um, but 
what we do have is a culture of club and people that pack, come and pack that joint out and make a heap of noise. Uh, and that's incredibly special. And, and I'm, I think that's a really good sign that we've been able to rebuild that senior team under strong leaders. I mean, we've had multiple women's coaches, but they've all been there for the right reasons. Uh, and Trevor Lee and Craig Stratford, youth and, youth and senior men, have, have really built that men's program to be something that people want to come and support and be a part of. Um, so, so culture is important, but it is, it is living and dying by it. And, and, but it is also for us, it's club wide, not just team, not just team focused. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, I saw one of your games last year against center of excellence and the atmosphere was great. Packed house, as you said, small gym. Yep. It, was, it was a lot of fun to be a part of. Um, now with your role at Eltham, how do you, what kind of pathways do you provide for, your coaches to build that culture and so that all coaches are on the same page? Do you have like meetings with all of them together individually, conferences? How do you make sure you build that culture up but also sustain that culture because that's something that needs to be worked at. It's not just a one-time thing. Yeah, it is. It, it is. And, and coaching was something we recognized. I think it's the bit that we probably haven't done as much work on as we'd all love to. Uh, our referee structure is in a really good place. Our scorers, statisticians, our administration program, there's, there's streams right across the association that genuinely provide pathways all the way to, to, to the elite level and in international games. And we've got example after example of that. Coaching's the one, and this isn't, our, this isn't an Eltham issue. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bigger problem across Australia. Um, there's no real set pathway for a coach. You've got to find your way. You've got to get lucky. You've got to know someone. It's tough. It's really, really tough. Uh, and you've, you've got to have a, people employ you in those coaching roles who trust you. So we, we've taken, it's probably we, six or seven years ago, we probably used to get really excited at the prospect of going targeting coaches from other clubs and recruiting them in. And, and still today, to get a couple isn't a bad thing. But, it, you know, you, we come back, the club culture is very much about building from within. It, it always has been. That's what we used to love and also hate about Eltham as an opposition. But we've taken a real tact probably in the last four or five years to say, right, who are some young people or, or who are some parents or those involved in the club that actually are passionate about what they want to do here and pursue it as a pathway? Um, and so we've, we've tried to, to help make that happen. Uh, I mean, the coaching, we're incredibly lucky. Someone like Carly Stones, who's just been named as a, I think the 18's Vic, uh, Vic Country, um, development coach someone at that level is currently coaching under nine boys for us in domestic which Chris Cameron who's our we've re, sorry let me just we've restructured our coaching leadership structure where it was previously boys and girls at championship level we've actually thrown that out the door and said we've got a, a lead coach for 16s and 18s and that encompasses boys and girls and then a lead coach for 12s and 14s encompasses girls and boys and, and also allows for the flow that that 12s and 14s level, you're encouraging the players from domestic into championship. And at the 16s, 18s end, you're tying it with the senior coaches and encouraging the flow of players in. So the senior level, in, sorry, the, the, the older juniors into seniors, I think we've done really well from a coaching and player perspective. And at the lowest level, we've done really well, but now it's about getting a little bit of um, consistency across boys and girls. And that's been the strategy with that. In doing so, what it's now allowed for is, is for Chris Cameron as our 16s, 18s lead coach is to now start really knuckling down on the coaches who want to get into the X's and O's and want to get into the details and things, more specific game tactics and, and scouting and processes. And, and the things are going to help these kids and the coaches be able to take an opportunity, be it at youth level or, or, or senior level at Eltham or somewhere else. And then for our 12s and 14s coaches, whether it's the coaches that are just starting out or is it, you know, coaches such as myself that quite, you know, happy to, happy to go where we go as, as we do with a fair few people, um, but are maybe are passionate about dealing with those kids that are, are nine to 13, then we can get our teeth into helping those kids and preparing them. Um, I've got a bit of a belief that 14s is the end of your, your true junior career. Um, and that's culminated by the under 14 national champ club championships that are hosted that are helped. Uh, and going and then into 16s is the beginning. It's almost like you're starting again. Now you're starting to prepare for senior basketball. And certainly there's a connection to both. But that's sort of how I try to 
I, I guess, speak to, to parents and kids about it is this is, you go into 16s and now this is starting to your trajectory towards what do you want to achieve? Where do you want to go with, is, is it college? Is it here in Australia? Or is it, you know, you're enjoying because you love the game and regardless of the level at top or bottom, you, you, you just love playing. In terms of coaches, it's a little bit the same, man. This is part of my job, Basketball Victoria, educating coaches and, and hiring good coaches to run courses and education clinics. What makes a good coach? What makes a good coach? I mean, a good coach running one group in one program can be a terrible coach doing it exactly the same way. It can be a terrible coach in a different program if the culture and their what they want is completely different. So for our senior coaches, they need to know what I want and, and that our board want and what our club is looking to achieve. And there can be no, there can be no crap in that. It's got to be, we've got to be on the same page as to what we want to achieve and what is realistic for us to achieve. Um, you know, Trevor Lee's a really good example of that. When we had him come in and rebuild the men's side in 2014, I think it was. Um, I remember in, in the second year, the team was sitting at two and seven, something like that. In, in, in state champ men, well, two and seven, maybe second last on the ladder. But what we'd outlined is a bit of a, it was a, a three-year plan. And that's, again, it's, it's something everyone talks about, but it was reality. We put into practice. A three-year plan was about scrapping the, basically cleaning out the decks. It was one or two elfin blokes. One of them we recently interviewed John Lister that we wanted to hold on to. But otherwise, it was let's rebuild this with good quality people and good leaders supplemented by young people from within our program and rebuild it. Um, and, and when Trevor was two and two and six, I think it was, in that second year, we re-signed him. We re-signed him at that point for a further two years. And it was like the shock of the, you know, I, I remember getting phone calls from people, how's this? But we had a plan. And whilst the wins and losses hadn't gone the way we wanted it to, the, what, was, what we were building towards was on the right track. It was sitting with what we wanted. And we wanted to show uh, Trevor, but also our playing group and those outside we are going in the right direction and we are, we are working towards something here. And this is confirmation that we're achieving that. Uh, in that fourth year, I think we we're on the brink of finals. Maybe we just knocked on, maybe we just scraped into finals, which was kind of the plan. But midway through that fourth year, before we'd even qualify for playoffs, we'd, we'd announce Trevor for a further contract again. And that's when, you know, in that period, uh, um, yeah, I might've been a year out on that, but, the idea was that, yeah, we, we got ourselves to the top of the big V tree alongside Ringwood. Um, I think we came runners up in 20, 2018, uh, but that really was the launch pad for us to get our contract into NBL one. And so that as a coach in his second year, people would have probably classed that as a failure, but in our eyes with what our plan was, it was good coaching and it was what we wanted. Uh, and so I think it's important. Junior coaches need to have an understanding with a clear direction with, with the parents. You know, it's junior coaching is damn tough. Junior coaches have got to have an understanding with their director of coaching as to what the plan is and what the realistic goals are. But you also need to relay them to parents and to kids and make sure they're all on the same page. And remember, I, I said before that I'm really embarrassed sometimes is when I look back to what I did as a, as a coach sometimes and the, what I said or the way I behaved. And that's one of them. You sit there and go, I don't want to deal with parents. I block my ears and say, I don't want to talk to you as parents. I didn't want to bar of you. That's not my job. Well, it is. Um, parents are a part of the gig in juniors and, and uh, it's important to keep them in the loop as to what's going on uh, and keep engaging with them as to what the plans are. And so, you know, when I'm coaching, I, my teams get emails once a month, once every five or six weeks. And there's a little bit of, hey, this is what we're working towards. And kids and parents get devastated by a result. A loss to a team that's at the lower end of the ladder and you probably shouldn't be losing, but parents get upset by it, as do the kids, as does the coach. No, no two ways about it. No point hiding it. But it's then also about just communicating, well, how, why, what are we trying to fix? And also then make sure the kids understand we are working towards something here as well. This isn't just turn up, play and go home again. There is a plan of what we're working towards. And I think that's a part of life skills for them, whether they become basketball players or go into a career, it, it helps them. Yeah, I love that you're not, that you've really focused on. It's not, you know, the short-term goal in basketball. It's so easy to be short-sighted that this year we need to win a championship or we need to win the next game. And if this doesn't happen, then it's a failure. You guys had a long-term goal. Everybody understood it. People from the outside, didn't but that's not their business not being in the club they're looking at the short-sighted part of hey they're not winning games they need to change coaches change players 
But as part of a long-term goal, you did exactly what you wanted. Now you're one of the most successful clubs in Melbourne, NBL one, great culture. I think it's great advice, you know, for all clubs is don't always think in the immediate. There's so much more going on than, you know, the next six months or the following year. Um, do you guys have like something in the club that is common for all teams? An example is when I was playing in France for, you know, the professional men's team, the way we played defense was trickled down to every team, guys and girls, through the under nines, under sevens, just giving them a base understanding. So the whole club operated kind of on the same base understanding that this is how we play defense at this club. Now that could be anything. It could be offense, defense, culture. Does Altum have like, you know, we'll call them pillars that everybody abides by from top to bottom that helps the club move in the same direction? There's something we're certainly working towards and that's realistically not to the same level that they do in Europe. Uh, and that's something I would love to, <laughs> something I'd love to do is to replicate some of that, that philosophy that, that they have in the European clubs. Um, I mean, we're operating at the moment under nine boys as an example, uh, for the season that was supposed to happen, we'd, we, we'd gone over 45 under nine boys teams. That's just as Eltham Wildcats under our, under our banner. What we've found incredibly hard to do, and this is the same at the smaller clubs, because remember when I was going right back to Coonong days, it was very difficult. How do you, how do you get across to 45 volunteer, probably 30 of them, a mum or dad coaches? Um, mm -hmm. How do you get across to that age group philosophies that we want to teach? And, and coaching at domestic level has such a revolving door to it and parents really keen to do, say, the nines and tens because then they don't... Uh, I'm, I'm generalising. It's not everyone, but a lot of them then want to get out when they get to 13s, 14s and go, no, 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 they're past my knowledge base. So it, it's quite difficult. Such a revolving door to, to implement philosophies across the club is really, really difficult. Um, We've certainly got to that point within championship. We roll out, I think it's 55 VJBL teams we, we had for 2020, which makes us, I think it was second, second most behind, behind Melbourne Tigers. Um, but across our 55 VJBL junior championship teams, there is certainly an emphasis defensively and uh, some basic rules. Um, we're really proud that the, the no zone rule that came in at VJBL for 12s and 14s, that, that came out of our club and um, our then... Um, girls director of coaching uh, led that charge and, and certainly Eltham was, was a big driver behind that. That came from us uh, and that was built on the philosophy that there's no point that you shouldn't be playing zone defence at 12s and 14s. That was a rule for us. It was a rule for a lot of other clubs and so it was just about getting the politics of it done which, was, which is an outstanding result and is now normal. Um, but offensively it's something that, you know, we've talked a lot about in this downtime and that's probably been the best thing about COVID is it's allowed us to reflect a little bit and say, what, you've been able to hit the reset button. You know, you've seen basketball in, in Australia here now. We actually don't stop. Basketball is the one sport in Australia that just keeps on going from coaches to players to management. So the ability to sit back, reset and say, no, we're going to take two months off here from what we're doing to roll out this new way of operating is actually incredibly difficult. And we have this little event in January, which takes up our December, January, Christmas holiday break that, uh, that makes it even more difficult at Eltham to, to prepare for. Um, so this period has allowed us to do that and work with our coaching. As I said, we, we've changed our coaching structure, our coaching leadership structure. And a part of that is being able to implement within the older age groups and the younger age groups. Um, more accountability on our coaches at junior championship level to be running some club rules and club principles, which I think is important. We just haven't been able to do properly in the past. Okay. Yeah, I love that. Um, obviously, I've only been in Australia for, you know, almost two years now, but it's definitely something, you know, when I see with Eltham and all these clubs, it's an opportunity during this COVID is to really not change the club structure and values, but just reevaluate how can we improve on this because it's, by the only time in our lifetime we'll have this much time off to really work on that without being distracted by games, tournaments, practices, et cetera. Um, going forward, what would you like to see happen to improve not just basketball in Eltham and Victoria, but in Australia based on what you've seen throughout the years, the people you've met with and talked to that could take Australian basketball to the next level? Well, there's a lot of things heading in the right direction. Um, you're always – there's just – there's just so much red tape 
all the time. This feels like there's red tape breaking through in order to achieve things. Um, facilities are key. Uh, you know, you, you've seen it out here in the north, north and, and specific Elfin, we're in the northeastern area. Um, facilities are required, you know, to play out of some of the gyms that we do to train and compete out of the gyms we play in is, is awfully hard. Um, soccer and basketball are the two global sports. They're the two biggest sports participation-wise in Australia, um, soccer being football. Uh, and, and for basketball, the greatest challenge is getting those facilities to cater to the needs that are out there. And uh, but to that point, you know, it's, it's having a... It's getting to a point, I don't know how you do it, but, but you need to have associations that are stable. Sorry if you hear my dog barking here, Steve. I just got a little excited. Um, it's having some stability across associations though as well. You know, I'm incredibly lucky at Eltham. It's one of the reasons why I took on this job nearly 11 years ago was Eltham was a stable place that wanted to progress and it's remained that way, I, I like to think. But it's got to be stability across those associations to allow for, allow for the employees and, and, and then the, also the, the, the staff and the, uh, the volunteers to drive it in the right direction and have some trust as to what they're trying to achieve. And that's just all too often you're seeing right across different associations, right across Australia is this high turnover, which then makes it, it makes it unstable. It then makes it hard to work with government, be it local, state, federal. Um, you know, something I've been very lucky to do is to build relationships, genuine relationships with government, particularly at state and federal level. And so we get outcomes from it. But if, if associations at the local level are constantly changing, um, the trust levels in, in the sports, in the, in the basketball industry specifically, um, starts to deteriorate and makes it very, very hard for us to make progress. And so as a sport, we've got to be a little bit more trusting of each other and working together to achieve some outcomes. Um, uh, just northeast, you can say, I think it was within the space of a couple of weeks, you know, we've got our, our facility at Montmorency Secondary College with three new courts. It's what is an 18 and a half or $19 million stadium being built, not, not even five minutes up the road. A um, couple of weeks later, Diamond Valley, uh, Nillimbic Council announced that the Diamond Valley Sports Complex gets a three-quarter upgrade as well. And you go, it's just about having good quality people involved in a region with good relationships with state, federal, state, and, and sorry, local, state, and federal levels and, and achieving outcomes. And that's kind of what we need to do right across the board to, to make sure the sport continues to prosper. I definitely think Eltham is... Um, the module that you want to emulate, you know, based on the team, the culture, how you guys help your coaches grow, that there's not a large turnover every year. And I think if more clubs are able to look into the way you guys do things, this could really help basketball Victoria, basketball Australia grow because there's so much potential. Um, one of the things I love about Australia is just how many kids love basketball. Um, I wish 2020 has been tough with that but I mean everywhere you go every gym on a Saturday morning is just filled with kids who just love it who are playing whether it's the rep level VJBL Big V domestic you name it so there's just so much room for opportunity to grow here um, I'm just looking forward to helping RMIT do that I love being able to just emulate what you guys are doing at Eltham um, and try and just build from there um, is there any advice you would have for people who are either in the coaching ranks or even the administrative ranks who are looking to, to go in their regards to high school? It, it's being flexible and, and making sure you've got clear communication lines, both up and down. Um, you know, communication is the one that people want to complain about pretty quickly and easily. So as be as open, flexible and transparent as you possibly can be. Um, you can't be expected to have answers all the time. Uh, you're not going to get everything right all the time. You're going to make errors, but your hand up, you own your mistake. Um, recognize what you, what you do well, what you haven't done so well, and, and try to evolve. But keep those communication lines up and down. Uh, and then good people will recognize that. Good people will see that and and uh, support you and reward you along the way as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for taking the time to be here this morning. Love the information you shared. Definitely worthwhile so anybody who's going to listen to this on helping with coaching, building a program, a culture, you name it. There's just, this is just packed with great stuff. So I really appreciate your time this morning.